What is your attachment style? Are you secure? Are you one of the three insecure? And how does that look now that you're an adult? And how can you move to a place of connection? Mm -hmm. Mended light. All right, folks, we're going to be talking about attachment theory today, which is all the rage in psychology. Oh, my gosh. It has been for decades. It's been around for a while. Uh, we're going to talk about one type. There's only one type of secure attachment, which is secure. And yeah. then there are three types of insecure attachments. Well, and here's what I love about this. Because of neuroplasticity or your brain's ability to change, which yeah. they didn't think was a thing decades ago. No. No. Um, you can change from an insecure attachment to a secure attachment. Right. And so how do you move there? Well, first you have to identify what the heck is going on with you. And for all you secure attachment people, pay attention just to make sure. Just to make sure you're good. There's not really anything to massage out there, okay? And for everybody else, let's figure out what's going on and point you in the right direction. So there's secure attachment and then the three types of insecure attachments. Uh, we're actually going to just do layman's terms. There's actually a, they're more a little more precise psychological terms. We're going to label them in the ways that just make sense. So there is anxious attachment. Anxious attachment occurs in childhood when your caregivers are inconsistent, right? Sometimes they're very warm and nurturing. Sometimes they're harsh. And sometimes they're distant and even negligent. And so the child is anxious because they don't know what type of parent they're going to get. And they're aching for consolation and aching for connection. Yeah. And consistency in that mm -hmm. consolation and connection. Then we go into avoidant. Avoidant is, no, my parents aren't inconsistent. They are consistently negligent. They are consistently absent or they're present physically, but not emotionally. Yeah. Emotionally detached or I can't rely on them or they're... Like I'm the phrase a safe space, right? Because yeah. someone can be physically safe, but not emotionally safe, right? Yes. So physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, like there's all these different aspects of our life experience. Yeah. And it's not, it's not all of them are safe or all of them are unsafe or, you know, or Correct. our parents are connected in all of them or not connected in all of them. Right. Very common. It's, it's like, yeah, they know how to do these things. They don't know how to do these other things. Right. And, and you can have a different attachment style in different relationships at the mm -hmm. same time. So I, we're painting in very broad strokes here. There's more nuance in real life. But, okay, insecure, so there's anxious because my parents are inconsistent. There's avoidant because my parents are consistently negligent, so I'm just fending for myself. And negligent can be true, or they just don't know how because they were never taught. Yeah, yeah, they can be very present, but what they're yeah. doing isn't yeah. leading to connection. Right, and and the hardest one, I think, is the emotional connection, right? Right. And that's not to say your parents didn't care or they don't love you. It's that they didn't know how to show up emotionally the way that you needed. Yes. And then the last one is disorganized. Disorganized attachment comes when you actively fear your caregiver or your parent. And that is the dominant emotion of that relationship is that you live in fear. So now that we've laid these out, let's explore what they look like in childhood, see if this describes any of your childhoods and what it was like for you and how it plays out in adulthood. Starting with secure attachment. Secure attachment means they're there for me when I need them. They're consoling, they're nurturing, but they also provide structure. Mm -hmm. I feel like I know what the rules are. I know what behaviors will lead to what outcomes. Yeah. Because it's consistent and that I am loved and accepted, even if sometimes there have to be consequences for my behavior, of course, that I'm loved and accepted and welcome. So what this looks like in infants and in children, they cry when they're distressed and they want to be close to caregivers and parents. And then they stay close and they're easily soothed. If you have a child who's crying and the presence of a caregiver is soothing and it works. Yeah. They have a secure attachment. They have a secure attachment. The child, not cognitively per se, knows like I go to this person and it's safe yes. and I get my needs met. In adulthood, this is known as autonomous, right? It's an autonomous attachment or it also called secure attachment in adulthood. But what are some behaviors of adults who are securely attached? Yeah. So when other people are emotional, they can show up in a loving and supportive way and they seek support when they're upset, like mm -hmm. it's safe. It's safe for them to be a safe place for someone else 
and they also seek other people when they need safety, right? And yeah. once again, this is emotionally, mentally, physically, always. They communicate their needs directly in a healthy way. And they continue from childhood to be easily soothed. It, yeah. may, it may not and be- And supported. And supported, right? Yeah. If people are trying to comfort them, they receive the comfort and it works. Yeah. With anxious attachment, remember my, my caregiver is inconsistent. Right. Sometimes they know how to show up, sometimes they don't. They're probably overwhelmed. They probably have their own wounds. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a mixed bag. It's a ball of yarn. <laughs> and so I show up with great anxiety. Why? Because I'm ringing the bell. I'm ringing the alarm bell because maybe that means they'll really be here, here for me. Because, you know, it's like if you go to the doctor and you say your pain level's a three and they go on to the next person. No, my pain level's a nine. It needs to be treated right now, right? I'm approaching this with a lot of anxiety so I get action. I want comfort. So what does this look like in children? Well, like securely attached children, they cry when they're upset and they want to be close to their caregivers. But unlike securely attached children, mm -hmm. they don't, they're not soothed easily. Yeah. And they're not especially warm and responsive. They're more standoffish. Like, where were you when I needed you? Or they, or they treat the parent with contempt or ambivalence. So what does this look like in adults? So they are hyper vigilant about other people's feelings yeah. and they need constant reassurance that they're okay, that the other person's okay. And they communicate their needs in a drastic way, right? Yeah. It like, it's big, they yeah. go big. A lot of drama is, is what people on the street would say. I wouldn't say that cause that's judgmental. And once again, they still in adulthood don't feel easily soothed or reassured. Right. They're not very easily comforted. And, and it comes from being in a dysregulated state because all of the insecure attachments are a dysregulated state. Their your yeah. nervous system is dysregulated. It's just how it's manifesting. And in children whose attachment style is avoidant, they experience that emotional dysregulation, but they keep it in here. Yeah. And outwardly, they maintain a calm demeanor. Because what's the point of showing distress if I'm going to be judged for it or if I'm not going to get my needs met for showing it. Mm -hmm. So people who are very stoic and don't open up, what this looks like in children is the parent comes back and the child doesn't seek to reunite, doesn't yeah. seek to connect. Now, I wanna be very clear. Some children are just a bit more independent yeah. uh, and, and they don't need a lot of closeness, but how you could tell is if it's a healthy attachment is they will go to the parent when they need it. They, they do want to experience the closeness once in a while. So once again, if, you, if your child does a lot of things on their own, it doesn't mean they're insecurely attached. It doesn't mean they're avoidant. If they're hurting, if they're scared and they don't come to you, that's something to consider. But like I was saying, they look calm outwardly, but inwardly their cortisol levels are through the roof. Yeah. There's a high level of stress, but it looks like a freeze or maybe even like a stonewalling. Yeah. So in adulthood, this is called dismissive. It's, it's a dismissive attachment style or personality. So how does this show up in adulthood specifically? Oh, yeah, I relate to this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you're uncomfortable in the presence of emotions, right? Mm. And you don't, you have a hard time outwardly expressing your emotions. It's really, really uncomfortable. And so you don't know what to do for other people uh, when they're emotional and and you also don't know what to do for yourself when you're emotional. Right. And so you often seek coping mechanisms to distract or avoid. And you can even find empathy and comfort uncomfortable. Right, when other people yeah. are being nurturing, it's yeah. like, ew, it's mushy. Or yeah, no, I, I gotta get out of here. Can we be yeah, done? Or, or even like, I don't need this. Like, why are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I, I don't have feelings. <laughs> <laughs> or or I, I manage my feelings just fine on my own. Thank you very much. Yeah. Because it feels safer to do so. Right. Well, and that's part of this is that you don't communicate your emotional needs to others because growing up, what was the point of that? Yeah. It never worked. And this brings us to disorganized attachment. This is when you live in an environment as a child that is actively scary. Uh, you live with a lot of fear of getting hurt, of being hurt. So what does this look like specifically in children? Well, erratic behavior right? When you're upset and, and you, you go back and forth between fight and flight and freeze and you're living in this triggered response, in this, in this flooded response, there is no peace. It's always just hypervigilance and how do I stay safe? Children with disorganized attachment seem afraid in the presence of their parent or their caregiver. And they're not calmed when that person is there. In fact, they're more calmed when that person is not there. Yeah. In adulthood, we call this a fearful attachment. And some of you are going, some of you have had it really hard and you're relating to this. What does this look like in adulthood? 
Yeah, you can shift back and forth between clinging to someone and being avoidant. You feel angry and disorganized with any sort of emotion. Yeah, whether... it's disorienting for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and to that point, if they feel emotional, they get angry and disoriented. Because, and I'm not talking about feeling unemotion. I'm talking about feeling emotionally flooded. A lot of us struggle when we feel emotionally flooded, but these people get angry and disoriented. Yeah. You struggle to trust the intention of anyone. Yes. Well, and I, I had people that I worked with when I was younger uh, who were victims of abuse who then became abusers. Mm -hmm. And for them, a lot of it was they saw the world as a vicious, cruel place. And that everybody had malintentions. If someone was kind to you, it was a manipulation. You have to keep your guard up all the time. And that's why that was because their guard was up all the time. Yeah. And any sort of attachment relationship feels unsafe. It feels yeah. unsafe to be attached. And as humans, we need healthy attachment. Yeah. Like it's a type of oxygen, right? Like we need it to live. But if I'm attached, I feel like I could get hurt or abused. Yeah. Right. That, there's a power differential there and that's what it all comes down to. Okay. So we've established that with secure attachment, you feel emotionally regulated. And when you feel dysregulated, you reach out to the people that care about you mm -hmm. and you're soothed and it works. With the three different types of insecure attachment, even though they look different and there's different backgrounds for each one, yeah. it still boils down to I'm emotionally dysregulated and I need mm -hmm. to get to a place of calm yeah. and a place of soothe. So how do we do that? Yeah. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Um, and, and so many, I love that we live in a day and age that talking about this type of thing is socially acceptable yeah. and all the ways to accomplish it are also talked about, right? Um, and so it, it's a process of teaching your nervous system that it's safe, right? Yeah. And whether it's physical safety or emotional safety or another type of safety or all of them combined, right? right. It is a process of rewiring your nervous system. So first it's recognizing that safety. And, and so if you're having a, a triggered moment, the best thing you can do in the moment is to breathe, right? Right. And so to do the box breaths where you count, you know, three seconds on each side, you breathe in and hold and breathe out for three seconds and then hold. So there's lots of breathing techniques. It can also be really helpful. When we're dysregulated, we're often not living in the moment, right? We're, right. we're emotionally going to another place. And so if you can rub your chair, if you can rub your hands together, if you can smell something, especially something you like, so essential oils or flowers or perfume, yeah. as many of your five senses that you can incorporate into that moment will help you stay present. Um, so anything that feels soothing to you, whether it's a cup of tea, if it's hot chocolate, if it's a bubbly drink, right? Yeah. Anything that feels soothing to you is going to help. Grounding, walking around on the grass in your bare feet. There's even grounding mats you can buy yeah. if you don't wanna walk around um, outside. And so it's anything that helps you, one, feel safe, and two, keeps you in the present moment. And once you have provided that safety for yourself, um, you can then get curious about what your experience is and, and dive into what am I actually feeling in this moment? Sure. What beliefs am I holding on to that aren't actually serving me? And it quite often is that you're coming up with beliefs from previous experiences, right, of that it's depending on your attachment style that it's not safe to reach out to others or when you reach out to others you get hurt you know it's mm. it's these beliefs that you need to one become aware of and then two get curious about because all these attachment styles are coping mechanisms and it's not that our coping mechanisms are bad it's that they kept us safe and what yeah. what happens is when we move through that experience and we no longer need those coping mechanisms, what used to keep us safe is now keeping us stuck. Right. And we cognitively often don't realize it. Well, for example, if I have an avoidant attachment style because growing up, voicing my concerns didn't get me anywhere, no. well, then I looked after myself and that served me to a point, but now it doesn't serve me in my relationships yeah. when people want me to open up. Or in a disorganized attachment where speaking up or being emotional was punished, 
uh, now people want me to open up and they want to connect. What served me then isn't serving me anymore. Yeah. And that's why we need to remove the judgment from it, right? Yeah. It's also helpful to challenge the narrative. I love something called narrative therapy, which means that the facts of your life story can't change. They don't change. But the meaning of the facts is right. open up to reevaluation and reinterpretation. So rewrite the script. Recognize that you did the best that you knew how with what you were given and what you knew. And now you're in a different place where you can choose something different, where you can choose to open up, choose to trust, choose to connect. And you don't have to give it all at once in a rush, but you can take a step and see what the other person does, right? And, and let your trust be earned. It's not about giving your trust. It's about opening yourself up to let that trust be earned. Well, I know that we can just barely scratch the surface of this here and now. That's why we have a deep dive video course on our membership site called Being at Peace. How do you rewrite the narrative? How do you work through past trauma to be at peace and to be secure in who you are and in your attachments? If you enjoyed this video, we invite you to check out It Takes a Community, How to Heal from Trauma. Uh, we talk about secure attachments and what role that plays in trauma recovery. Check it out right here.